Okay, so Job is probably one of the most ancient figures in the Bible, but he says some things that make it sound like he believes in the coming resurrection of the dead. So today we're going to look at two places in the book of Job where he says some of these things, and we're going to ask the question, did Job, did ancient Job believe in the Christian teaching of the coming resurrection of the dead? So Job probably lived in the time of Genesis, probably in the time of people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We don't know that for sure, but when you read the opening chapters, and his wealth is described in terms of cattle, and he's kind of functioning as priest for his family without any organized temple religion or anything, offering sacrifices for his family, this is the same picture of the lifestyle that people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had. So he was probably alive during that. That was a long time ago. And just from the Bible alone, we don't have much of a theology of resurrection up to that point in the scriptures. So the rub here is, well, wait a minute, how could Job have known about the coming resurrection of the dead so long ago? We're going to look at the first place where he says some of these things that sound very resurrection focused, and we'll look at it from both sides of this argument. The reason we're doing that is people with a really high regard for scripture and who really know a lot about this stuff are on both sides of this argument. Some would answer one way, some would answer another. So we're going to ask the questions for a while, and then I'll give you my own answer to it. So we're in chapter 14 right now in verse 7, and Job is talking, and he gives this metaphor of a tree. And he says, basically, there's hope for a tree that gets cut down, that it will rise again. But, he says, if a man dies... He's not like a tree stump that another shoot might come from it. No, if a man dies, he's, he's dead. And there are two ways to read what he says here. He says, a man dies and is laid low. A man breathes his last, and where is he? I'm starting in verse 10 now. As waters fail from a lake, and a river wastes away and dries up, so a man lies down and rises not again. Until the heavens are no more, he will not awake or be roused out of his sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath be past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my service, I would wait till my renewal would come. Okay, so two ways you can look at this. There are really three things here that make it sound like perhaps he is hoping in a coming resurrection of the dead on the last day. Three things that make you think this. Number one is he says, until the heavens are no more, he will not awake. So he's not going to awake until the stars fall and the heavens are no more. And there's a new heavens and new earth and everything gets created. All the stuff we read about in Revelation and in Jesus' words, until that happens, he's not going to wake again if a man dies. And then he says, oh, that you would appoint a set time and remember me. As if, oh, when I die, I'm going to be remembered one day and brought back up from the dead. And then finally, he says, all the days of my service, I would wait until my renewal should come. As if he's looking forward to a renewal. So either he is looking forward to a day when after he dies, God remembers him, God renews him, and as the heavens fall and as this new creation is made, God raises him from the dead. Either it's that, which is the Christian teaching of the coming resurrection of the dead on the last day, or many people believe he is just talking pessimistically here, and it would read something like this. Now, the phrase, till the heavens are no more, can be used in the Old Testament to mean forever and ever. A lot of times it just means forever and ever. So, till the heavens are no more, he will not awake. Some read that and would say, oh, he's saying forever and ever, for all eternity, he will not awake. Oh, that you would appoint a set time and remember me. Some would say that that means maybe you would remember me and, and then I would die. Like, remember me and kill me instead of remember me and bring me to life. And when he says, uh, all the days of my service, I would wait until my renewal should come, some would read that pessimistically, cynically, saying, well, if you, 
If you lay down in the grave and wait for your renewal to come, you'll be waiting all the days, forever and ever and ever. And so there's one reading of this that's very hope-filled, very, oh, the last day will come and a man will rise, even though uh, a man will die and not come back until then. Or there's the very pessimistic reading. Some lead toward the pessimistic reading because his whole point is that when you cut a tree down, a new stump can come, but people don't work like that. Okay, so you got the two sides there. Some saying, okay, he's contrasting a man and a tree. Tree, chop it down, new stump can come up. Man, chop it down, he's never going to come back up again. So he's pessimistic about the resurrection, that's his point. Others would say, no, he is doing the tree contrast thing, but he is acknowledging here that there is hope in a coming resurrection on the last day. And it's those three explicit pieces of language that do that. Okay, in chapter 19, once again, Job gets to a point where it sounds very much like he's talking about the resurrection of the dead, and people look at it two very different ways. And this time it gets real interesting because he's talking about a Redeemer who he knows lives. There are two ways of looking at this. One is to say, okay, in the past, Job, especially in chapter 9, has accused God of wronging him. This is, this is Job's problem, by the way. He is a righteous man, just, God-fearing, but when all this suffering comes on him, he turns to a point where he is accusing God of wronging him. And his argument is, hey, I'm a good person. I shouldn't have to suffer like this. That's his problem. He justifies himself like that. So, okay, in the midst of doing that in chapter 9, Job cries out for an arbitrator. Job cries out for somebody who will go to God and kind of stand in between him and God, like a redeemer or an arbitrator or an advocate would have in the old days, almost like a lawyer on his behalf, and will say to God, God, you are wronging him. God, this is a good man. You should not be hurting him. And so one reading of what we're about to read is to say that Job longs for that arbiter to come. Others would say that he longs for the true redeemer Jesus Christ to come, and he's looking forward to that Redeemer. Here's what he says. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Okay, so is he looking forward to Jesus rising him from the dead, and that's how he will see God? Is this true saving faith right here? Or is he looking for this arbiter to come and argue his case and say, Job is righteous, you should do good things to Job and raise him from the dead? Those are the two ways people are looking at this. Next, we'll look at my answer to that question. Okay, I gave you the question for long enough. What's my answer? I believe that Job is looking forward to a coming Redeemer, but that he misunderstands what that Redeemer will do for him. But even though he misunderstands the role of the coming Redeemer, the coming Advocate, we have enough in there, I believe, to see a robust theology of the resurrection. In other words, I think he is hoping for a coming day when the Redeemer comes, the heavens are no more, and the dead are raised. Here's why. First, we look at chapter 19, and he is looking forward to that Redeemer. We have pretty good reason from chapter 9 and a few other places to associate that with this advocate that he is longing for. And it looks like his argument is going to be, hey, I'm a righteous person. Maybe one day this Redeemer, this Advocate will come and argue for how righteous and God-fearing I am so that God will remember me and do good things to me one day. The reason I think we can say that is because of verses 23 and 24 in chapter 19. He wants his words written down, remembered, inscribed on a rock or in a book, so that when the Redeemer comes, this Redeemer will know how righteous Job is. Now, that's a misunderstanding of a few things, right? First of all, 
Job is not perfectly righteous. He's good and God-fearing, but no one is righteous enough to earn their way into heaven. And second, that's not what the Redeemer does. The Redeemer, Jesus is his name, doesn't look over your life and say, Father, this one is good enough to get into heaven. That's not what the Redeemer does. No, the Redeemer says, Father, this one is even worse than he or she thinks he is, but they cling to me for forgiveness and I have died in their place. Will you accept my death in the place of their sins? And will you forgive them? And that's an argument the Lord smiles upon. That's an argument that the Father hears, and then he welcomes us into his kingdom. So that's what the Redeemer really does. And Job misunderstands that because he is leaning on his own righteousness. That's why in chapter 32, his friend burns with anger at him for justifying himself. And that is why toward the very end of the book, Job says, I repent, I despise myself, I repent in dust and ashes. Because he's tried to justify himself rather than letting the coming Redeemer justify him. That's what he gets wrong. What he gets right is that there is a coming Redeemer and that the dead are going to be raised. Two reasons I think we can see that. First, we've got enough language in the book to know that he is looking forward to a fleshly resurrection. Here in chapter 19, he says in verse 26, After my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. That is a bodily resurrection. After my body rots, yet in the body I will see God. Right? So he's got some things wrong, but he's got the coming resurrection right. All that other language I talked about earlier in chapter 14, all that applies as well. Pretty clear, even though the language can get murky at times, there's enough to say, okay, he's got a theology of the resurrection. He gets the coming resurrection. The other reason comes from the objection most people would raise to that. And that objection is, well, wait a minute, how could Job have known that? Especially if he's a contemporary of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I mean, by Genesis 11 and 12, we don't have a theology of the resurrection yet just from those books. And my argument to that is that we're looking at that wrongly. They actually had access to revelation that we don't have access to now. They had a few things. They had their oral tradition by which the stories of Adam and Eve and the flood and the tower and all these things would have been handed down to them. And so Job probably had access to the story in Genesis 3 where the serpent is told that a descendant of Eve would come and crush him and his seed. So he's got this promise that the serpent will be crushed by a coming redeemer and all of the seed of the serpent, which includes death, because in that story we learn that sin leads to death. Death came in the world through sin. So he's got enough right there to hope that one day death will be undone by this coming redeemer. Not only that... But there were prophets in the days of Genesis. We know that Enoch, at the very least, was a prophet, and Abraham served in many ways as a prophet. So who knows? There could have been even more prophets walking around giving true revelation, perhaps teaching very robust things that we wouldn't even have access to today because their words were not written down. They could have known even more than we know today. So because of those reasons, it's not implausible to believe that Job would know about the coming resurrection. In fact, he already knows of the need to offer sacrifices for his sons and their sins. Well, where would he have learned that from? Unless it was from the oral tradition or through the prophets or something like that. He already knows many other things about how good God is and that there is a God in heaven to be feared. He knows so much. It's really not implausible that he would believe in the coming resurrection. In fact, he has all the pieces in place already in Genesis 3 to know that. So if he had access to the oral tradition or to a prophet who might have revealed these things, there's no reason to believe that he couldn't have known that. Not only that, but if he is indeed alive at the time of Abraham, then he is alive at the same time as someone else who looks forward to the resurrection and believes that the dead can be raised. Because Hebrews chapter 11 says that Abraham offered up Isaac on the altar, believing that he would receive him back from the dead. 
So if that's the case, Job is, even isn't the only one alive in that day looking forward to the resurrection. So for those two reasons, I believe we can look at Job's story and his words and say, yes, he gets a few things wrong and he's corrected by God for those things, but he does look forward to a coming redeemer and a coming resurrection of the dead.